All right, good morning. morning. Please take your Bible, turn to a couple places. Um, Psalms 119 and Psalms 68. Psalms 119 and Psalm 68. And uh, while, we're, while we're turning there, uh, we left off Thursday night on uh, the, Re- uh, the beginnings of the Reformation and uh, the beginnings of the resistance and the dissatisfaction uh, with the established church and also um, uh, the Word of God beginning to be disseminated and spread. Um, they used to call... They used to call the Middle Ages the Dark Ages, and there was a reason for that. They were dark. There was no light. Look at Psalms 119, Psalms 119, and look what David says here in verse 130. Psalms 119, 130, the entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple, and uh, the scriptures the fall of Constantinople in, in 1453, as that's where we ended on, uh, on, on, on Thursday night. Uh, a lot of Christians, or nominal Christians at least, fled the, um, the uh, Eastern Empire and headed into Europe and brought a lot of Bible manuscripts with them. Up to this time, most people outside of a few fringe groups like the Waldensians and uh, and, and, and a few others. They, outside of that, almost everyone had the Latin Vulgate. And uh, with these uh, new Greek uh, New Testaments that more represented the old received text that had been corrupted, as we talked about uh, a, a few lessons ago, uh, people began to look at things again. And not everyone that looked at them was saved, but Erasmus was, and I think we ended with him uh, the other night. Oh, there we go. Hey, it's working. Thank God. Amen. And uh, Erasmus, um, of course, is he humanist. Back then, a humanist was not like a humanist today. It just meant that a person could even be called an atheist uh, for just not believing uh, when the Pope spoke ex cathedra or when, when the church uh, was authoritative on something. And so uh, he was a humanist in the, in, in the Middle Age sense, but he was actually a friend of the Brethren of the Common Life there in Holland. He had a lot of sympathies with them. Erasmus is the one that collated a few uh, Greek New Testaments and, and published them in 1516. And uh, look at Psalms chapter 68, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on him, but Psalm 68, well, I've, I've, I've mentioned before, every one of these people that were breezing by is, is their own lesson, uh, but Psalms, uh, Psalm 68, Psalm 68, and look what it says in verse 11, the Lord gave the word, and he did. Great was the company of them that published it. And you're going, to see it, you're going to see something new happen in the world uh, with the proliferation of scriptures. Uh, the great uh, Lutheran historian uh, Daubini said this. He said, the only true reformation is that which emanates from the word of God. The scriptures, the holy scriptures, by bearing witness to the incarnation, death, and resurrection of the Son of God, create in man by the Holy Ghost a faith which justifies him. And you need the scriptures. And uh, as I told you last uh, week, or earlier this week, Martin Luther was an adult before he even read the scriptures. And I think he was in his second year of, of, of studying theology before he actually got into the scriptures. Now, when we talk about the Reformation era, um, there's a, we technically, Bible, Baptist doctrine didn't come out of the Reformation. It existed a long time before that. But you had among the reformers, Martin Luther and Ulrich Zwingli in Sweden and John Knox in Scotland and Cyril Lucar in the Greek Orthodox Church and uh, John Calvin, of course, is one of the well, well-known ones in Geneva. And, and these guys, these, these men were all Catholics. And uh, they, sought to, uh, they sought to reform the... The existing church, and, and here's kind of the difference. They sought to exhort 
of reform the existing church with the Bible, which was still better than what was going on. Okay? But then there was another group, a little more radical, I guess, and, uh, and uh, that, was, oh, that developed right alongside the reformers. They didn't come out of the Reformation. They developed right alongside the reformers. Uh, and they, they essentially uh, um, uh, tried to start a new church. Start a new church and uh, not reform the old church based on the Bible. And that's a big difference. That's a big difference because the, the reformers, they didn't give up a lot of the old Catholic doctrine, like baby sprinkling and amillennialism. And that's the difference between these two groups. Now, when we get to some of the great ones, when we get to some of the great reformers, we see Martin Luther. And uh, I think only Abraham Lincoln has more biographies written about him than Martin Luther. And the man literally rewrote the map of Europe. And I have here him saying, if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it was I. Martin Luther was told the Lord, um, had an Apostle Paul type uh, situation where experience where he was riding his horse through a, a thunderstorm and got struck off his horse and uh, promised that he would uh, serve the Lord and become a monk if the Lord would spare him. And, he, and uh, like a lot of these guys, like, just like uh, Wycliffe with the, the plague, and uh, he entered a convent, or not a convent, I always say convent, monastery, the other one. I hope he didn't enter a convent, <laughs> you know. I heard it was the thing to do. But, um, and he was very serious. He was very serious, and he started to, he started to study the scriptures. And uh, he became very concerned about his soul. He was at a pl place called Erfurt, and the famous theologian John Staupitz visited in, him there. And Luther would, would in his cell, uh, would, would thrash around and moan and, and sweat and groan uh, because he didn't feel like his sins were forgiven. And Staupitz was one of the first men that, that talked to him, walked him through the Apostles' Creed again, told him to believe in the forgiveness of sins, and then Martin Luther would keep repeating that. But then that old Catholic, who I think was born again, brought out this to him. He said, no, no, not just I believe in the forgiveness of sins. But he says, think of the words that the Lord said uh, uh, to, 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 the, to the lame man where he said, thy sins be forgiven thee. And he says, it's not just that Christ died for everyone's sins, but he died for your sins. And you need to appropriate that to yourself. And so uh, that's, that, that was the beginning of Martin Luther's conversion. And, uh, conver uh, uh, conversion. and he really, he, he turned the world upside down. He turned Europe upside down. And uh, he was ornery. He was very ornery. Very, a very passionate guy. Very fired up. And uh, he started out, he started out a, a very submissive Catholic. And, and in his, his initial letters to the Pope, you would have, uh, you know, gracious, most gracious father, you know, and, and these type of things. And as time went on, they, they didn't talk to each other that way. Toward the end of his ministry, he addressed the Pope as most hellish father. Um, and uh, and he, he, he kind of... He, he, got, he got bent out of shape in a lot of different ways. Of course, he was, and I told you before, he was climbing Pilate's staircase there, uh, that, the staircase that was miraculously transported from Jerusalem. And about halfway up, he came to himself and thought, what are you doing? And that verse came to him, uh, the just shall live by faith. And he was very disappointed with Rome and, and a, lot of their, uh, a lot of their misuse and, and, and abuse of, 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 of money. And you know, he came from a very poor area and Rome was very wealthy. And what really, what really set him off was the sale of indulgences. And that's where a person could buy a certificate getting themselves or a family member out of purgatory for a certain amount of time. You could buy this by a good deed, but in the golden year, because uh, the Pope uh, wanted to make sure he could pay Michelangelo to update things around the, the, the Vatican, he, uh, he started selling extra indulgences where people could buy them and their family members out of prison. 
and, uh, and uh, John Tetzel, the, the, the guy that was peddling them in Martin Luther's area, just a jerk and, and a con man, total con man, and can't go into it, but Luther eventually nailed 95 theses to the door of Wittenberg Chapel, uh, condemning the use of indulgences, and he just, every time he got into it, he was forced into a more conservative and a more biblical position every time he started arguing. And when he started arguing, he would always appeal to the apostolic fathers, but the, and the more he got pushed on that, there were just as many apostolic fathers that were full of it as there were ones that were biblical. And so it kept pushing him further and further away from, from the church mixing of tradition in the Bible and pushed him toward a biblical position uh, to the point where he came up with, and he would often say, sola scriptura, scripture only must decide our faith uh, and our practice. And uh, the Lord used him in a mighty way. He, he uh, was, of course, they tried to kill him. He was promised safe passage to the, to the uh, Diet of Worms there in 1521 and called to uh, defend himself against the emperor, Ferdinand. Ferdinand allowed him safe passage. And, of course, the, the bishops, the Romans, tried to uh, convince uh, the emperor uh, when he got there because he, he made his, his, his famous remonstrance, where, unless I am convinced by Scripture that I am wrong, right? I can't change my mind. Here I am. Here I stand. The famous words, here I stand. And uh, so the Roman, the Roman leaders tried to convince Ferdinand just to kill him then and there because he was already getting a following. But... Ferdinand was old school. The emperor was old school on that. He had that old soldier's uh, respect for the flag of truce, and he would not dishonor his word, and so he allowed Luther uh, to leave. Luther, uh, of course, then fled, fled um, to Wartburg Castle and started working on uh, the translation of, um, of the New Testament into low German, something that the people could understand. He used... He used Erasmus's Greek New Testament. They say that Luther hatched the egg that Erasmus laid. This man was under great spiritual oppression. They say that when he was translating there in his study, he, he felt su such a spiritual battle and, and such intensity as the devil trying to stop him that one time he took his inkwell and threw it at the wall. He thought the devil was over there. Because, look, this is, this is going to change the world. A lot of people are going to get saved. And uh, by, the time, by the time that he left Wartburg Castle, um, he had so many people already that loved him that he was safe and he was able to travel more freely throughout Germany. It happened that fast. Uh, the world was ready for it. The fullness of the time had come. And so a uh, lot, you could say volumes, volumes have been written about that man, but he was born for such a time. He was born for such a time. A friend one time said to him, he said, uh, Martin, Martin, don't you know that the world is against you? And he said, well, then I'm against the world. <laughs> it's against the world. It's an interesting note that one of the Bibles that he referred to in translating the Bible into low German was the Tepel Bible, which was an old Waldensian Bible uh, hidden in the Alps for centuries, hidden from the Pope for centuries and then translated into Bohemian in the 14th century. And uh, so there's, there's a line there of truth uh, that God honored. And he was quite a guy. I mean, yeah, <laughs> you know, he'd get ornery sometimes. And uh, one time, I believe, some guy was making fun of him. He liked to draw, and he basically drew a donkey with the guy's face and the donkey's <laughs> rear end. And it was you know, an ass and an ass type thing. And uh, he... Uh, he was quite creative and a little over the top sometimes, but a guy to take on the world like that, I guess he's got to have a little fire. Yes, he's got to have a little fire. And when we talk about the reformers, and we want to go quickly through this, when we talk about the reformers, uh, John Knox, uh, he, uh, he fled Mary Stuart in England when you had those uh, four or five years there um, after Henry VIII died and, and then his son uh, where, uh, where she started killing Protestants, and that's when Hugh Latimer, the guy we talked about Thursday night, was, was burnt. Uh, John Knox fled to Geneva. Of course, he was a warrior. On a, he was a galley slave for about uh, two years uh, uh, for the French, but he got out of that and ended up in Geneva, studied under Calvin, went back to Scotland, and, uh, and really gave 
uh, in the English a hard time. He was a hard preacher, hard prayer. Uh, Mary Stewart is said to have said, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the armies of Scotland. And uh, this is where the, the Presbyterian Church in Scotland comes from. Now, these guys, they are reformers. They're not, they're not premillennial Baptists. Uh, they're all, most of them, are, they're all Catholics. And most of them, uh, to, to a greater uh, or lesser extent, stayed within the Catholic paradigm of the one true church. Right? They just wanted to reform it. Now, Zwingli, was a, uh, he was the Swiss reformer, and he was a converted priest, very popular, great preacher, and uh, he preached justification by grace through faith. Uh, probably the freest place in the world that time were, were the cantons of Switzerland up there in the mountains. And uh, he, uh, he preached free grace, and there in Zurich, he was called the people's priest there, and a very popular priest in Zurich and disputed with Luther over transubstantiation and that kind of stuff. Uh, all the while, all the while, uh, the truth is blowing up, and you can't contain it because of the Bible. He died in the Capital Wars of 1531. He was trying to unite the Protestant cantons uh, into a, a, a Protestant state to take on the Holy Roman Empire. And once again, they're all millennial. They're all millennial. And so they think that they can bring in Christianity through the sword. And he ended up, uh, he ended up getting speared in battle by, the, by a, a Catholic army. He wasn't very old when he died. Um, I don't like to spend a lot of time on this guy because everyone slobbers over him. But uh, he did say this, John Calvin, he had a, lot, a great influence on, on Reformation thought. And this is, these, these are men that are empowered by the scriptures, Right? The, the reason they speak so authoritatively is because they have the scriptures. Do you remember what the, what the Bible says about our Lord Jesus Christ? He says that they were amazed. Why? He taught them as one having authority. They said about those disciples, uh, they took knowledge of them, right? Why? They, they perceived they were unlearned and ignorant men, but they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. The authority is not in the, in a man's education or his intelligence. It's in the word of God. And that's why no matter how honorary he is and no matter how vile he is, you'll notice that every American president will throw in a few verses of Scripture here or there. Oh, slick Bill Clinton, excuse me. President Bill Clinton used to quote Scripture all the time. Why? There's authority when you, when you quote it. Yeah, there's authority in that book, in that word. And so these men have the Scripture behind them. Calvin said, I deny him, speaking of the Pope, to be the vicar of Christ who in fiercely persecuting the gospel demonstrates by his conduct that he is antichrist. That's a common refrain of the reformers, uh, that the pope was the antichrist. And if you lived back then, you would think it too. <laughs> and uh, now one quick note on this guy, and I, you know, this study is too accelerated to even really consider what was going on in the East, but it's just an interesting note uh, uh, Lucar was the patriarch of Constantinople, basically the head or of the, the, the Greek Orthodox Church. And he was, read the reformers and, uh, and agreed with them and tried to institute the same Reformation reform, sola scriptura and um, justification by grace through faith within the Eastern churches. And we might have people in here today that grew up in an Eastern church, Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, all of, uh, all of those uh, uh, more Eastern European countries and further. Um, but it never, it never took. It never took. He actually was um, on his way back from Alexandria where he was uh, procuring a manuscript, Alexandrinus, that is used a lot these days in textual criticism and really was trying his best to work within his church, but he became a political football. The church didn't like him. And, um, of course, the, the Muslim uh, sultan of, uh, uh, didn't like him either. either. And so he was en they ended up strangling him on a ship headed back across the Mediterranean. But he was a man that, that did his best. And now you look at that funny costume uh, that, that he's wearing. But, you know, he said this. He said, the, the righteousness of Christ applied to the penitent alone justifies and saves the believer. 
and you want to think about what that would have meant to people, you know, uh, attending these churches in a cloud of incense and tradition and darkness to hear those words come across the pulpit. And it's just, it's just a thought, right? Just a thought. You're going to see that guy in heaven. He trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. I'm sure he was messed up on all sorts of stuff, right? But the, hey, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, you know, I, what I have found in my studies uh, and the more I read is that, yes, a corrupt, more wicked, satanic masterpiece of an organization has never been conceived by the devil than the Roman Catholic, the Latin Roman Catholic Church, and not far behind the Eastern Orthodox churches. And yet in that, even in that, there are many people that found the truth somewhere. And if at any point they trusted Christ as their Savior, they're saved. Amen. Amen. The Lord didn't put his son through all that to keep you out on a technicality. Right. Hallelujah. Amen. And I, I hope that I, I, it has been a comfort to me uh, uh, reading through, through this. And many of us who, who come from generations of the established church, you know, the, the Lord is not willing that any should perish. And, you know, you're going to see Martin Luther in heaven, but you're also going to see Cyril. <laughs> hey, dude. <laughs> it's going to be great. Now, when we talk about this, when we talk about the Reformation and what it did, and, uh, of course, its own study, but we want to remember this. We want to remember that they were all millennial. And they did believe that the church was bringing in Christ's kingdom. And so as a result of that, and I don't know if any, you know, in, in arguing with people, you often hear this, you know, there's been more wars fought over religion than anything else. You ever heard that talking to people? Well, that's not really true. Money is what wars are fought over. From whence come wars and fighting among you. But there have been plenty of wars fought over religion and oftentimes a, a pretext for war. But uh, during this era, it was all over the place. The Council of Trent started the Catholic Counter-Reformation in 1545 uh, to, to, to stem the onslaught of Reformation theology, and it was very successful in Southern Europe, not so much in Northern Europe. But I have noted there that the 30 wars year in Germany was essentially between Lutherans and Catholics. The religious wars in France were essentially between Huguenots and Catholics. In fact, uh, one of the first uh, naval battles off the coast of Florida was between Huguenots and Catholics. They were French Huguenot Protestants. A lot of them weren't even saved. Some of them were very political, but some of them were. Some of them were, but it was a religious war and uh, lasted a long time. The English Civil War, actually a three-way war, but Cromwellians and Catholics, and then the Irish got squeezed in there like they always do and beat to de the death. And then the Eighty Years' War in Netherlands was uh, uh, the Dutch eventually getting independence from the Spanish, and that was just an awful bloodbath, awful bloodbath. And much of this had to do with people resisting the control of, um, of, of nations that were themselves controlled by Rome. And I had mentioned, uh, I had mentioned earlier that the, that the Pope had a lot of, he had a lot of things at his disposal. Um, the, the papal interdict, where he would essentially, if, if, if a king would not submit to something that the Pope wanted, he would shut down the churches, shut down communion, shut down baptism, shut down, close the doors of the church. Now, that might, you know, if it happens here, like, good, I can stay home. I can watch live stream. I can walk around in my undies, you know, which is fun for a few weeks. Then it's not fun, you know. But, uh, but there, when you close off the church, I can't be buried in the, in the church graveyard. I got to, you know, be out in the potter's field. I can't have my babies. Look, my baby, the chance, just had a one-year-old birthday party yesterday. A lot of times babies didn't make it to a year. So parents wanted to get their baby in there and get them baptized and wash off that original sin right away. And, uh, there was a, and so when, when the church would close its doors, they cut off people from salvation. It was a very powerful tool. Yeah. 
that next communication. And so um, people were resisting this control, and it really was. It was a religious battle, but it was also just a, a, a battle for a freedom. And, uh, and we can't spend very much time on this, but we just want to remember that neither the Reformers nor the Catholics were premillennial. And um, the Clarendon Codes uh, in England even established to suppress religious liberty of anybody that differed from the Anglican Church. And just to show you kind of how this thing played out, uh, Europe just got torn up. These are the Hussite Wars in Bohemia. These are the men that claim to follow uh, John Huss in what would today be uh, the Czech Republic. And Pope Martin ordered a crusade promising indulgences to volunteers that would go kill uh, the, the reformers in uh, Bohemia and uh, promised them a special indulgence, plenty of time out of purgatory for raping and killing. And he raised 150,000 troops. They were defeated five times. See that guy with the eye patch? Yeah, Jan Ziska was his name. He lost one eye in a fight as a kid. You know, uh, the kid poked him in the eye, got infected. He lost that eye and then lost another eye in battle fighting the Catholics. Still directed um, his army blind and was actually one of the first guys. There's so much fun stuff here, but this is one of this guy developed some of the first tanks. He put his heaviest artillery on horse drawn wagons. You know, 500 years before tanks. This guy was a stud. And um, he said this. He said to his people, he said, you know, he was, he was dying. And they, he said, hey, don't you weep for me. This is what I want you to do. I want you to skin me and make a drum out of my skin and beat it when you're going into battle. You know. That's how, th this is how people were, you know. You know how, you know, people these days, they're always talking about, oh, you know, I can't believe how awful people were. I can't believe Thomas Jefferson had slaves and, you know, all this stuff, right? Acting like they knew then what we know now. Right. That was so awful. And the answer to that is, yes, it was. People back then were generally awful. They were, right? The, the more Bible, the more truth, it takes off some of those rough edges. But these are, these are some tough dudes, and um, you had three groups there, but there was one group, the, uh, the United Brethren there, who were non-resistors. There were 200,000 of them, but Ferdinand opened up, the emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor, opened up his own campaign on them in the mid-16th century, killed just about every one of them, and uh, the rest of them fled to other parts of Europe. And uh, uh, the, they have a, there's a lot to be said about them, but when I'm talking about the religious wars... In Europe during this time, uh, this is a Waldensian battle. Uh, this is uh, Marindal in the mid in the mid uh, 16th century uh, in um, in France, uh, and the Waldensians had fled to areas where they felt safe. And of course, there were rumors starting about them that they wanted to uh, they wanted to raise an army and uh, overthrow the Catholic powers, and so. Uh, you know, this led to that, this led to that, and they marched an army on this village, and, and uh, this is one of the times when they took the women and threw them off the parapets, as you see there, and, uh, and obviously treated them very horribly before that. But during this little campaign in 1545, there were at least 3,000 killed, and 24, 24 villages were, were, uh, were leveled. And uh, just too many, too many things to, to talk about other than it was just constant if you resisted the powers that be. Uh, these are all wars around Protestantism. Uh, Piedmontese Easter is a famous one in April 24, 1655. And uh, they refused uh, to obey the, uh, an edict either to leave or baptize their babies. And, and so uh, there was a massacre of four to 6,000 civilians and uh, the Piedmontese Easter was, this was the Duke of Savoy. And uh, one, one man uh, who was there wrote this down. Little children were torn from the arms of their mothers, clasped by their tiny feet, and their heads dashed against the rocks, or were held between two soldiers and their quivering limbs torn up by main force. Their mangled bodies were then thrown on the highways or field to be devoured by beasts. 
The sick and the ages were burned alive in their dwellings. Some had their hands and arms and legs lopped off and fire applied to the severed stumps to staunch the bleeding and prolong their suffering. Some were flayed alive, others were roasted alive, some disemboweled or tied to trees in their own orchards and their hearts cut out. Some were horribly mutilated and of others the brains were boiled. Some were fastened down into the furrows of their own fields and plowed into the soil as men plow manure into it. Others were burned alive or buried alive, excuse me. Fathers were marched to death with the heads of their sons suspended around their necks. I can't read anymore. It gets worse. And you can read about it yourself. That's the depths of Satan. And uh, your founding fathers knew that's what happened with the state church. They knew that. They carried that with them. That's why when Thomas Jefferson's daughter wrote him, she was in France, she said, Daddy, I'm thinking about being a nun. He got on a ship and said, no, you're not. I don't even know if that guy was saved. But they knew what that thing was. They knew what it was. Now, Mosheim, the, the Lutheran historian, said that before the rise of Luther and Calvin, there lay concealed in almost all the countries of Europe uh, many persons who essentially believed that a you had to be saved and baptized to be in a church and uh, as uh, in opposition to the state church. And it's important to note that Bible doctrine was all over the place in the Reformation. It didn't come out of the Reformation. And here's just a few examples, all right? You got Peter, whatever his name is, right? And he, he taught, he was a Bohemian, and he taught the separation of church and state a hundred years uh, before Luther. And uh, he taught the priesthood of the believers and a spiritual kingdom. William Tyndale believed the church should only have saved members. He did not believe in baptismal regeneration. He believed in a literal interpretation of prophecy. That's a hallmark of premillennialism. You go on and on. These guys are all English. John Hooper, Hugh Latimer taught a rapture and a second coming. Robert Brown taught separation of church and state. Many of these guys emphasized uh, liberty of conscience. Conrad Grable, Menno Simons, the founder of the Mennonites, taught that a church was, uh, the kingdom was spiritual and adult baptism. Michael Servetus, the Spanish guy that was burned uh, by John Calvin for, our, uh, for his teachings, uh, he, uh, he, uh, he was premillennial. And so they were around. And so once again, that's just, I know some of you read, I know some of you get on blogs, I know some of you talk to your Reformed and Calvinistic friends, and just, just be reminded uh, that as soon as the Reformation started and there was a little bit of opposition to the established church, these people popped up everywhere, which means they were already there. They just were in hiding. And so, um, got five minutes here. Wow. Fun. Now, here's the deal. These are Anabaptists. Right? They're rebaptizers. And uh, these people... Um, they believed in separation of church and state, and they believed that uh, they didn't believe, most of them didn't believe in infant baptism. And in that environment in Europe, they caught it from both sides. They didn't just catch it from the Catholics, they caught it from the Reformers. It's a picture there of a woman being birched, which is essentially take, you know, birch branches and, and beat them. And the women actually many times suffered worse. And there's a lot of reasons for that, and even uh, um, psychological, but... Uh, King Ferdinand declared that drowning is the best antidote to anabaptism. He called it the third baptism. And in other words, if you baptize, yeah, they're just, man, uh, you know, you, you want to baptize someone, their infant baptism isn't good enough, fine. They take them over to the river and they tie a rock around their neck and they, and they drown them. And, uh, and that, was, that was not just the Catholics, that was the Reformers. Anabaptists, as you see there, were jailed and run out of Protestant Zurich with executions until 1614. Felix Manns was drowned by the Protestant city council in Zurich. Uh, Balthasar Hubmeier was, uh, uh, Hubmeier was tortured on the rack by the Protestant Zwingli for rebaptizing. And on and on and on. And so they got it from both sides. Europe was not a place... Uh, that promoted uh, liberty of conscience. Now, just a note on these people, and I, you know, this is a famous picture, but this is 
This is Dirk Willems, and he was in, he was in uh, Holland, um, ne the Netherlands. And he was, of course, arrested for uh, uh, preaching some Anabaptist doctrines, and he escaped. He escaped out of jail, and um, he was running across a frozen lake, and the papists were, were chasing him, and one of the guys that was pursuing him fell through the ice, and Dirk fell around and pulled him out of the ice. And then the guy arrested him, they took him back to the jail and tortured him and killed him. But the Bible says, wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And you can't do that without the Lord. Yeah. Can't do that without the Lord. And as we see this thought developing, you know, we have John Smith, and he's what people say is the first modern Baptist. And um, he looks like he's part of a late 70s, early 80s rock band. <laughs> That guy's doing it, man. He's doing it. He taught that the Lord's Prayer was a pattern. He recognized only church offices. And he, he really cemented this because this was they went back and forth on this. But he said the baptized must be one that confesseth his faith and his sins, one that is regenerate and born again. And he drew a clear distinction between the waters and salvation, that they are two very different things. And, uh, of course, he was part of the church that split and eventually were pastored by John Robinson uh, that um, was then uh, became part of Brewster's group that came over on the Mayflower. The, these folks were all kind of connected. He was an Englishman that fled to Holland because it was not safe to be a, 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 a nonconformist in England. But his, his progeny, Thomas Hewless, uh, said this, and uh, he said this, he said, um, where is that? There it is. He said, he wrote this to the king of England. He was, they were jailed. They were jailed for their faith when they went back to England. This guy started the first Baptist church in England in 1612. And he said, the king is a mortal man and not God. Therefore, he had no power over the mortal soul of his subjects to make laws and ordinances for them and to set spiritual lords over them. You see that doctrine of separation of church and state? And it was very evident in those early Baptists. Very evident. And the reason, the reason that we have what we have in this country is because when, the, when they came over here, they, they, uh, they were so sick of being persecuted for their faith and for the first time, uh, when they came across the waves, when, you're, when the new world was opened up, they had a chance to form a society that would allow men to worship according to the dictates of their conscience. And in America, we take it to, for granted. But over there, it was just, it was, it was normal to be persecuted if you believed anything different. And to understand uh, American uh, society, even in the early days of, of the United States, men were jailed and, uh, for preaching the gospel. And some were killed and jailed for preaching without a license. And uh, I'm going to go ahead a little bit, but just to kind of give you an idea, I want, I want to read this and we're going to be done. Roger Williams the, uh, founded uh, a Baptist, essentially a, a free colony in Rhode Island. And in the documents of Providence Plantation, this guy uh, rejected infant baptism. He was influenced by a Baptist in England, and he became convinced that a person must follow the dictates of their own conscience. And so in the charter of Providence Plantation in the founding documents, religious liberty was put in there. You could be a Muslim, you could be a Jew, you could be, the state could not force you to believe a certain thing, right? Where did they get this from? Well, they got that from the Bible, but coming from the old country, realizing what's going on, you see, and, and uh, to have an appreciation for it, and, uh, and uh, I'm just going to read you this, I'm going to read you this, there was a uh, some, some preachers in Culpeper, Virginia, and, uh, in 1774, and they were jailed. They were Baptists, and they were jailed for preaching. And uh, they, 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 uh, they, as people were walking by in the town, these guys were sticking their, you know, their heads through the bars and preaching to people as they're walking by. And people are mocking them and making fun of them. And there was a young man in that group. Uh, that was listening to those preachers that day, and it really bothered him. 
and he wrote to his friend, William Bradford, he said, there are at this time not less than five or six well-meaning men in jail for publishing their religious sentiments. Pray for liberty of conscience to revive among us. That was James Madison, and you know him as probably the most influential framer of the United States Constitution uh, that guarantees religious freedom and freedom of speech in these things. These men were greatly influenced by that doctrine and that preaching of men who believe that a person uh, is accountable to the mediator, Jesus Christ, and to God. And only in this country at that time did you have anything like that. We ought to be thankful for it. Father, love you. Thank you for the Bible.